Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 575, that is 575 of the Agostino Zynga show, I hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you. How am I? Doing well given all the circumstances of life and trying to make sure that I keep one foot in front of the other and just keep breathing in through my nostrils and out through my mouth you know how we do you know how we do it's the end of the week i um, hope you are looking forward to the weekend as much as i am i'm doing absolutely nothing in terms of going out i'm just using it as times to sort of like recharge sit down and chill so that should be fun and yeah just get my thoughts gathered really it's been a bit of a barnstorming couple of weeks for me since you know the vacation coming back home and working and doing whatever it's just a whole been a bit of a whirlwind and obviously balancing the stuff that i'm doing here and other things i want to do outside of work so that's been something to kind of get used to and then getting back on my gym flow that's been a bit difficult as well but in all actuality this is a weird link to make i've been surprised <laughs> how um, much my life has been enriched and somewhat um, made the better since I've got this new laptop which is an old one but it's just a new uh, refurbished version there is something to be said for having something that just works as soon as you turn it on and you don't have to do other things to get it going and it just improves my workflow so I'm able to record cut up clips make YouTube thumbnails and quickly upload stuff on my channel really quickly much quicker than I was prior because if you would have seen me before I was uploading made uh, you know, 10 videos in a day you know in between the episode and then the clips and then whatever I needed to record after the fact but sometimes I'd have big gaps because it just took a lot of you it just took a, it would take a lot out of me to get those things turned around but now that I've got this new laptop or I've got this old refurbished laptop and I've kind of got it where it should be in terms of working again I'm finally back to the place where I feel like I can start getting content out quicker and turning it around much faster than I was before and it's really helping me to get stuff out and it's really making me motivated to start doing more things so that's been something that I am really really happy um, has happened over the last few weeks and stuff so I'm really happy about that. I'm also glad and thankful as the week is ending that the Premier League season is coming to an end too. I've had enough of watching my United play. I've had enough of everything that's around the team. And off the back of Eric Ten Hag managing to clinch the, the Dutch Premier League for Ajax in his final season, I can't wait for him to start. I'm really curious to see what happens. I'm actually more curious to see the players that leave and to see the players that get benched and to see which players get sort of like, um, how would you say that phrase? brought up on stage right i'm curious to see what happens because there's surely going to be some curveballs thrown in there surely we're not going to be left with the same old people playing in midfield it won't be another season of fred mctominay it won't be another season of harry Maguire and lindelof it won't be another season of having to rely on Shaw and flipping iron one bissaka at fullback i hope there's going to be some level of change but i'm really curious to see first of all who gets let go um, which players get promoted from the from, from the side in terms of you know maybe getting a starting position, and which players clearly you get to see are not in the manager's kind of good graces. I'm really curious to see that going forward. So that's going to be an eager one. And the transfers I'm not really that bothered about who we get. There's all this noise already in the timeline about Frankie De Jong. I could give a toss about getting a nice glittery marquee signing to appease all the FIFA lot. I don't care about that. We have a really long road ahead of us as the United fans and as a club in general. This is not going to be a quick fix. So, Eric Ten Hag coming in is part of a long-term plan. Whether or not he will be the long-term successor is, you know, remains to be seen. But he's definitely going to play a role in our overall long-term plan. And even if it doesn't work out for him, I still want us to go and approach it the same way we did when we hired Eric Ten Hag in terms of identifying somebody that has a way of football or style of football that the club wants to adopt. Um, recruitment at the club is also in sync with an acknowledgement or a flipping... Um, desire to promote youth team players all these things should still go in to our decision making process i don't want us to get to a position where god forbid flipping eric ten hag falls flat on his face and flops you know ronald the boss style frank the boss style whoever that manager was 
And then we end up going to go get the next glitzy manager because we've already tried that one route. Let's go back to what we know. No, let's commit to something. Let's do what all the other clubs are doing in the world, especially the top tier clubs. We have a, you know, this first time in a long time, we've actually got a director of football at this club in terms of steering the ship in the right direction. Let's just trust those people to make the right choices, to hire the right people, and then give them the space, the resources and the time to get it right. That's what I'm hoping for anyway. One can only hope. Next on here. Sorry about the gulping. If you're wondering, I'm drinking some tea because why not? Tea's lovely, man. A bit of old tea, a little a bit of um PG tips, no milk with a little bit of honey. You can't go wrong. It legitimately might be one of the best beverages ever. Whether it's hot, whether it's room temperature, whether it's just cool, it's legitimately one of the best beverages. It's proper, proper, proper um, versatile that way. If it's cool, you chuck in some ice cubes in that bad boy, squeeze a little lemon in it, boom, wash that down your esophagus. You are laughing. So, yeah, I'm not going to, you know, apologize for drinking tea. I'll just apologize for gulping on the microphone. We continue. Next, I wanted to talk about, I wanted to quickly give my thoughts regarding Ozarks because I remember I spoke about it previously or maybe I haven't actually when it comes to stuff that I watch actually I need to do that more often somebody messaged me and say I need to do more music reviews which I definitely should do on this podcast because I'd listen to a ton of music obviously being a fan of music in general and also being a DJ I'm kind of always hunting for new stuff like stuff that you probably wouldn't think I'd be into I'm listening to but I don't really have a place where I kind of capture that um, apart from when somebody might ask me, oh, what's a new, what's a new, what's something new you listen to that you think I might like, then suddenly my recommendations come out. But I'd like to have a, some sort of record of the stuff I listen to, and maybe we can share some stuff and whatnot on this podcast too, and maybe some recommendations here or there. But anyway, that being said, I'm also a little bit of a of a whore when it comes to TV series nowadays. Not so much because my time has been taken up with other things. I don't really have the time to sit down and watch as many different shows as I did in the past. I still can get for a season, but before I'd be banging out three or four shows, you know, in the same flipping week or something, right? Trying to hammer them through one after the other. But um, I did manage to finish Ozark season four. I do think this second half because they split the season in two. They dropped one half in you know a few months ago and then obviously this half recently and i do think this half is far more better the most recent one is far better than the first um but i still have a lot of grabs against the show one of the main grabs i have against the show is the is this idea that the bird family who have essentially again this is going to be spoilers you know ahead so if you don't want to hear what i'm going to speak about then make sure you fast forward or something or you just x off the video if you're watching a clip because i'm going to be full of spoilers here the one thing I don't like about Ozarks is that for whatever reason, the writers have deemed that the Bird family, who are kind of a family who basically stumble into a life of crime, they don't really have criminal tendencies about them at all. They stumble into a whole entire family, not like Walter White style in Breaking Bad, where it's one man kind of saying, fuck you to the, fuck you to, to the world or fuck you to life, society, um, to whatever, right, to his fortunes. I'm going to take my life in my own hands and just do what needs to be done in order to kind of live the life that I want to live. No, this is, a, and then him kind of pulling his family in along the way. This is an entire family um, essentially being corrupted at the same time, especially when it comes to Wendy and, or is it Mark Bird or whatever his name is, right? And I really hate it because the reason why I hate it because it's not realistic. Like you get, you got these two middle-aged, you know, men and women who stumble into a life of crime where they're essentially um, washing the money of drug cartels, Mexican drug cartels to be specific, right? Very brutal Mexican drug cartel people who are known for their vicious uh, ways in terms of how they get their, their way in life. They're dealing with those guys and somehow throughout three seasons of many ups and downs, four seasons sorry, of many ups and downs, many mistakes, they are somehow still alive forget the kids the kids is one thing but for the main couple to still be alive after all this time is a real i think black mark on the writing it doesn't make any sense part of me thinks they wanted to do it that way in an effort to kind of show that sometimes the worst people get away with it which i can understand and i'd imagine if you're if you are involved in a mexican drug cartel and you're helping them money their loan uh you're helping them launder their money 
into legal businesses or to just wash it so it's clean so they can launder it into whatever they want to do with it you would imagine that person will be somewhat valuable an accountant a business advisor you'd imagine it would be but we've heard many many countless stories of accountants lawyers money ma money managers being blown up in their cars thrown off of bridges hanged off of buildings mexican drug cartels don't care they don't play you cross them and it's end they like to send very stern messages out there so that people don't cross them because if you hear some little rat lawyer who was making a mexican drug cartel billions gets you know gets off you know because he made one mistake it's going to make you make it's going to ensure that you keep your head in the swivel and that you make sure you concentrate and you know do your job well so the fact that this family the birds made so many mistakes along the way uh did so many fucked up things tried to take advantage of situations tried to outsmart them drug mexican drug cartel and they still end up surviving it really does irk me i have to be honest it kind of irks me and especially when you consider the ending of it where Ruth Langmore, who I think is one of my favorites, who no, I think is definitely one of my favorite characters in the show, she ends up, you know, meeting her tragic end, even though she was one of the people in the show, I felt like, who managed somehow by a lot of effort to pull away from the bull, the bird the bird family, you know, vortex of misery. It was it's such a it's such a flipping um it's such a vortex that's hard to kind of pull away from it feels like every character that kind of crosses paths with them for a pretty long period of time somehow ends up paying the price whether it's um inadvertently or inadvertently or inadvertently but i feel like ruth langmore her character finally was able to pull away finally was able to get on her own two feet by swindling them out of the casino which was brilliant to see finally ends up having you know the the grace or the luck to get her record expunged she's the first langmore i think to have a clean record she says right and she's gonna start anew and then she ends up getting off at the end which is obviously tragic but makes sense because considering who she killed but still if there was one person who decided who deserved to die it was definitely wendy bird at the end of season four for sure she deserved to get off 100 percent. she was so annoying so annoying as a character i'd never understood this but there was a line in it where i think the writers tried to justify it by basically saying something along the lines of her saying oh i think she was arguing with the girl that that owns a, the pharmaceutical company and or somebody you know i know maybe it was one maybe it was an ex cop actually the pi he was like oh you don't get to play hero you don't get to you know to be the good guys in the story and i think wendy says something oh yes we do something like that like a quick quip so maybe the writers knew that it wasn't going to be well received the ending so they wanted to justify their writing by saying that no these people are like the coke family they are like this whatever family the clintons whatever they are right in that they do get away with the most heinous crimes because of just who they are and because of luck because of white privilege whatever it may be but i just think it was a bit of a hard watch to kind of um buy into the idea that the mexican drug cartel would allow this family to remain intact considering all the bother that they've kind of put them through you know the amount of bodies that have dropped you know from the mexican drug cartel through just knowing the the bird family is, is pretty nuts when you think about it especially when you could think when you kind of consider that they are basically law-abiding citizens you know to a certain extent yet they've been responsible for many deaths of you know um henchmen and foot soldiers and muscle from the mexican drug cartel it's pretty mad but anyway it's a decent enough show great acting throughout everyone does a really good job in it to be honest there's not one actor in it who i'm annoyed by and i think they all do a really good job in terms of um you know uh sh taking us on a journey of what it feels like to go from being a somewhat normal person to someone that's involved in high high levels of organized crime so it's definitely something i recommend you check out if you haven't already next on the list i want to quickly update regarding the whole <clears throat> young feather and gunner and ysl rico man it's been really sad to see these pictures of Gunner on the internet, these mugshots. Obviously, his mugshot's been released. That was the first thing. This is courtesy of Michael Seedon. It says, Breaking rapper Gunner Sojo Kitchens has surrendered to authorities in Fulton County. He is charged with conspiracy to violate the racketeering influence and corruption, um, sorry, and corrupt um, organizations act, aka RICO. 
and obviously he looks incredibly pissed off in this in this uh, mugshot there is no smiling or trolling for the internet that is somebody that's really annoyed that the system has gotten hemmed up like this but this isn't the, the worst the worst picture is this one this picture has been leaked of um Ghana looks like he's in court maybe he's at his hearing or something it's an image clearly taken from the live stream of them in court or something and he legitimately looks like he's been crying all night his face is incredibly puffy somewhat so much so uh, more so um, in comparison to this picture here he doesn't look as um, stoic or as um, saintly looking as um, young fuck did when he was at his hearing he definitely looks like somebody who finally the reality of the situation is finally maybe hitting home because i'd imagine at this hearing as well um, his bond was denied so um i think a lot of people were speculating online that because gunner's charges weren't as serious as the other people who were indicted the 28 people on there that most likely he would get let go because i think his indictment was basically that he was associated with ysl and that he threw up some gang signs it had some chains that he was wearing that had their moniker on it but it was nothing to do with actually committing a crime against anybody right or selling drugs or anything of that ilk and loads of people online loads of sort of you know um experts sort of in that field kind of hypothesized or guessed that maybe he would be released he'd be one of the first to go out on bail but it looks like this rico they're trying to send a message um and they basically denied him his bail and i'm assuming he probably was made aware of that before the hearing um but yeah he definitely looks like somebody has been sobbing and crying all night in his cell and it sure must be a mad reality to kind of be going through right because he legitimately is a pop star gunner now he outsold the weekend right on the same release day he outsold the weekend by i think fifty thousand units or something pretty crazy like first week sales he clearly has crossed over in the point where i think it happened to little baby too the same way i don't think we actually knew little baby crossed over until the numbers started looking crazy we didn't actually there was never a moment where it suddenly went from gonna being the person everyone everyone in the quote-unquote streets loves to suddenly kind of being somebody that people on daytime television know who he is and um, he obviously kind of leaned into the meme especially how, how he dresses and all that stuff and all the things that he says and the, obviously the pushing peace stuff for the last album was flipping genius and then i think the last bit of content i saw from him was this amazing um activation that he did with um, emilio pucci where he flew over to italy and he was doing this thing where he was on a boat in venice and he was hanging out with models and trying on cool clothes and beating a drum a tambourine thing on some at some dinner table he was at, like he was living life you're like okay cool and it was like he was out there on his own so he clearly just went there with his assistant and manager or something and just enjoyed and picked up a nice healthy bag got decked in some great pieces of clothing got exposed to obviously the european market maybe there was an opportunity there or maybe there was conversations while she was out there discussing a european tour whatever it was clearly a moment where you could see oh this man is clearly in his element he's loving life he's kind of on his way to reaching the next level that he wants to get in his career credit to him so it's always awesome to see somebody that you listen to on mixtapes suddenly living that sort of life and then bang in a blink of an eyelid it all gets taken away and now you're looking at some serious time in prison or just a prolonged time sitting down because i'd imagine part of the issue with being in jail is you know of course it's hell on earth don't get me wrong but in this case when you're somebody of some sort of notoriety it's the unknown right because obviously everyone around you and your team is going to want you to be is going to try and be optimistic about the situation because they basically rely on you for a paycheck so they're not going to give you the real and you obviously are in such in such a um, you're in such disbelief at where you're at right now given where you were at the day before and whose guts you were swimming in that most likely you will probably try and convince yourself also that things are going to be okay but you don't know so i would imagine the unknown is probably worse than just getting a sentence because a sentence obviously is brutal still getting told you have 60 months you know five years whatever it may be it's going to be harsh but knowing that you've got that time it's just a process just kind of ticking off the days you know it's hard don't get me wrong but it's still 
you know where the finishing line is going to be but sitting down like this in a jail not knowing what's what's coming your way what evidence the police actually have what other trump cards they're going to pull out from their back pocket um have your co-defendants snitched already on you should you be talking yourself to save your career who's looking after your mom who's looking after this who's looking after that so many things racing through your head so it's no surprise that he was probably sobbing and again this man's a legit multi-millionaire off of the back of saying pushing p and wanna flow and shit do you know what i mean that he's living a good life so to go from that to sitting in a cell where he didn't really expect it either harsh 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 stuff so um yeah thoughts go out to gunner and those man it must be a mad situation to be in i couldn't imagine anything worse personally but also this might serve as a as a reminder or as a kind of wake-up call for some of the goon kids out there like as as fun and as cool as it is to be associated with a gang come up as a rapper because you know the ties to the streets that rap has and hip-hop has are just undeniable and there's something that no one can break it just is what it is the real downside of it is that the consequences are grave it's either you end up in a grave or you end up getting locked up for a prolonged period of time and sometimes oftentimes it's time that you probably can't afford to lose you're not going to ever come back with the same amount of buzz look at bobby schmurda right he's got a lot of goodwill around him because he generally seems like a decent human but because he got locked up at the time he got locked up in and life has basically moved on he's kind of had to reinvent himself he hasn't just come back in and just started doing music and people cared he's kind of had to make people care about him through his personality which he's doing a great job at but it's not as if when he came out the world was the same again he had to pick it up and kind of start again you know from scratch basically and it feels like you know those guys young young Fug and gunner especially those two had built up such a good head, head of steam they were going to such good directions they were getting such favorable reviews and you know feedback and stuff and things were going well that you just feel like if they do have to sit down it might really derail their career to a point where you know it might not be what it once was ever again which is a real shame considering both of them are super talented and people that i listen to on a regular so yeah hold your head up gonna hold your head up next we're going to talk about this news that everyone's talking about on the timeline regarding StockX and nike so from what i understand of the situation StockX was trying to in their in their flipping wisdom were, were attempting to sell nfts on their platforms or you know entering into the nft space by having a separate market space where they'll probably sell nfts or allow people to really sell them cool whatever think of what you want to think about non-fungible tokens i personally think they're dumb gay godless and horrendous looking pieces of art whatever you may call them and i wouldn't waste a single dime of my own money on that shit personally that's just my own personal opinion but i get the technology behind it i understand the potential of it i get it cool but the art itself just talking from a purely artistic creative objective point of view i think it's trash StockX wanting to sell some nfts on their platform obviously the nfts will feature sneaker designs that they don't own or anything nike kicked up a fuss and said you can't do that those are our those are our things that we own you can't then sell them on and this whole legal thing happens where you know can you copyright an nft um does nike own the likeness of an air force one in all its guises whether it's painted on a with oil brush or with you know whether it's painted with oils with flipping watercolors whether it's imagining your head do they own it in all its entirety interesting debate well it looks like um nike wanted to put one in on them when it comes to StockX and just continue the beef and add it to another level when they when they basically insinuated the following this is it nike escalates StockX feud and says the site is selling fake shoes so in order to kind of really up the ante and put the you know pedal to the pedal to the metal they decided to say hey you know what fuck that you sell fake shoes fuck out of here and this is the following nike escalated this legal battle with sneaker marketplace StockX, saying it purchased four pairs of counterfeit shoes on the platform despite the company's promise that it only markets authentic footwear the world's largest athletic maker asks a federal judge to let it add claims of counterfeiting and false advertising to the current trademark infringement against StockX. it said they have obtained the fake shoes including a counterfeit edge of the one retro og from the marketplace between december and january 
the four pairs of counterfeit shoes were all purchased within a short two month period on StockX platform. All had affixed them, the StockX verified authentic hand tag, and all came with a paper receipt from StockX in a shoe box stating the condition and that the shoes were 100% authentic. Nike said in the court filing on Tuesday. Nike sued StockX in February in federal court. In Manhattan, accused the marketplace of blatantly free riding on Nike's trademarks and goodwill with a service called Vault NFTs. StockX argued that the NFTs aren't digital sneakers, but simply listings of physical sneakers that are stored in this vault that can be traded to users. Yeah, that's super sketchy. StockX said in a statement on Wednesday that it made its customer protection extremely seriously and invested millions of dollars in fighting proliferation of counterfeit products. StockX asked, added Nike's latest filing is not only baseless, but also curious given that their own brand protection teams have procured communicated confidence in our invitation program and that hundreds of Nike employees, including current senior executives, use StockX to buy and sell products. Whoa. So StockX were like, hey, if you're going to accuse us for selling fakes, we're going to accuse your own employees, including senior staff members of reselling shoes, which I think most of them do anyway. Because I know when I was at Nike, loads of people who were way higher, you know, who are in a, some sort of high position or taking advantage of the fact that our store at the time wasn't necessarily an official Nike outlet. We were kind of as well employed as, you know, um, what, do, what do you call them? Uh, freelancers or whatever it may be. So they could basically bend the rules a bit when it came to taking shoes out of our allocation. Very, very stodgy stuff. Legal scuffles are breaking out of NFTs. Uh, the, um, anyway. I think this is interesting in two very, in, no, in, for various reasons. The first reason why I think this is interesting is because this has long been the assertion in sneaker, you know, in sneakerhead kind of circles that StockX sells fakes, right? This has been kind of a common thing that keeps getting said. And for the longest time, StockX couldn't really fight against it because they didn't really have a you know any kind of authentication program that they do now but over the last few years they've definitely introduced it and stepped it up a bit and obviously introduced this thing where if you get this hang tag placed on your shoe if you send it to StockX it was basically a stamp to say yeah this thing is legit but unfortunately this issue 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 is bigger than StockX is bigger than Nike even or maybe it's something Nike has caused because at the moment with the quality and the level that replica sneakers are at now it's pretty much impossible to say whether or not a shoe is legit or not unless it's made you know many months after the initial drop has happened maybe unless it's made to a certain quantity and then loads of random ones appear even then you can still explain it you know if if you know you know in terms of Nike and how they fudge the numbers so the fact that Nike are unwilling to mass produce limited edition shoes to in order to kind of meet the demands of the customers that clearly want to buy them, because I've never understood now that sneaker collecting has now become a multi-billion dollar industry and everyone in your mum knows what a Yeezy is or has heard of it and knows what limited edition shoe is and what reselling is. I don't get this whole um kind of artificial scarcity that they kind of in, include in the market to make things more scarce when really the truth of the matter is people who are into Jordan especially Jordan ones they don't care if something's a GR if it's a good shoe they're gonna buy it so this idea that because things are limited that's the only reason why people buy it is nonsense people just want to have core cool things so if you can sell them core cool things it's still a win and also I'd argue that the global customer base for sneakerheads who actually want to wear cheetah print shoes isn't that big anyway so it's not like you're mass marketing them for the entire world you're mass marketing them still for a big group of people but much smaller than the general you know customer base of people who buy their shoes from jd sports so that's obviously an issue that's going on there the other issue also is that Nike is kind of getting onto his fuse. I think they're doing one with the other guy, that John Geiger guy, right? In terms of them basically arguing about whether or not they own the likeness of their shoe in, 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 in its entirety. Whether it's done, whether it's kind of used as a platform or as a mold or as a canvas to kind of build up your own shoe. Or if it's something that has been painted for to taking a picture of, sort of as an NFT. Nike are entering into a weird phase where they're basically saying that we own this shape everywhere. That ex everywhere where shapes can be ex can exist, represented, um, showcased, whatever it may be, which gets into some touchy um, territory. But I was also thinking off the back of this, this is also one of the reasons why I'm so adamant that reps play such a good role in sneaker culture at the moment 
because the truth of the matter is when you're buying stuff off StockX, especially stuff off resale, you're just doing it for your own pride to say that, oh, okay, cool. I bought this from a quote unquote legit retailer or legit marketplace, but there's no way of ascertaining whether or not that shoe is legit. There is no way. The authenticity, the authenticity checks things they do is bullshit. There is no way of knowing directly if that shoe is legit because Nike's quality standards are so poor anyway. Um, back in the day when I used to collect shoes, there was such a thing called B grades. I'm not sure they have them anymore, but essentially what B grades were was when shoes were manufactured in the Nike factories and something went wrong. Maybe they misdished the mud guard. They didn't pop you know punch out enough they didn't punch out the eyelets enough or just something or maybe the the outsole was the wrong color and they'd usually instead of binning them they'd sell them to places like t tj max tk max and which is why sometimes you'd go to one of those stores and you'd randomly find a really limited edition shoe that would have like a massive b on the inside or you'd find a limited edition shoe that was in a really big size like a size 14 or 15 and maybe didn't sell in the store or whatnot but the reason why I think the market is so messed up now at the moment is because the reps are such good quality. Nike doesn't want to supply um, enough quantity to meet the demand of the customers, right? And the reselling um, industry is booming, booming to a level where it's making it worthwhile for the factories in China to try and get these new edition shoes out quickly as they can so that the resellers can profit and so that they can make loads of money selling the shoes because people are now buying like what what are they called like uas right unauthorized reps like the reps are like the highest qualities or whatnot right which sell for sometimes close to retail so if you're a sneaker manufacturer or rep you know a fake shoemaker in china it's within your in best interest to try and get those shoes out as quickly as possible because you could legitimately move a hundred units easy to some reseller who's then going to pop those 100 units right onto StockX and sell them for you know 25 times whatever whatever the fucking retail price was you know like it's a really mad mad game and um yeah it's kind of funny to see just you know this happening to nike because i think for the longest time they've been taking a piss and making it seem as if it's one thing when it clearly is another thing like we know where all these backdoor shoes are going. Like I said before, I worked at Nike before. I know or I've heard of executives, um, you know, taking stuff, stuff out of seeding, flipping departments and reselling that or stuff they've been gifted themselves. Like, So let alone, people would look at us employees or people on the outskirts or people who had given the odd shoe here and there and they'll kind of turn their nose up at you if they heard you resold it. And it's like, nah, mate, I know people who have got legitimate jobs that pay them a hundred grand a year at this place who are reselling these shoes. Yeah, I mean, I actually need to resell these shoes in order to my fucking pay my rent or to go on holiday. These guys don't need to resell them because they've got enough money from their flipping yearly salary, you'd imagine. Because that's what makes it even much more fucked up. Nike also are very generous with the free allocation of shoes. So it's not like you have to even buy any shoes for yourself anymore if you don't want to maybe the limited edition ones you still maybe have to purchase but if you just want to have cool sneakers to wear nike will always give you stuff there's always a cupboard you can go into to pull shoes out from but still these 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 niggas these motherfuckers still will go out and resell and the worst thing about those guys is that they were also the tightest people so they were the ones who were above you who had more access to things who had a far more stable job in that building who definitely weren't going to get fired if some new marketing person came in as we were right we were basically at the behest of whoever was a new marketing manager they were really in a good comp really in a good comfortable position yet they still would be greedy when it comes to sharing a love in terms of giving other people a hookup or allowing you to take maybe the limited edition shoe in the size that you need. They'll be super tight with those kind of things. I never understood why, man. But again, I think once you get in on those places and you become the person that gets stuff and whatnot, it's hard to let it go, especially when you, t you tie that intrinsically to your self-worth or to your value as a human being, which I can understand. And I'm just glad I enjoyed that time as much as I did when it was there. Um, I didn't really tie my whole personality around it, even though I still love sneakers to this day. Um, it's definitely a, a, you know, a part of my life that I feel like contributed to a lot of great things I experienced in life in terms of meeting friends, in terms of traveling to interesting places and whatnot. In terms of my worldview, I think it's been thoroughly informed by my love for streetwear and sneakers for sure. But I never let myself get lost in the source. I never let myself get too attached to this stuff to the point where I would be doing, willing to do anything and everything to get a pair of sneakers on my feet. It really isn't that deep for me, man. It never has been. 
next on the list we're going to jump into this one courtesy of over under um featuring the unreleased pair of off-white and nike air force one lows in a light green spark that look absolutely incredible i really want these so 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 bad these color block air force ones that virgil did um the ones in green the ones in yellow the ones in blue i think are some of his strongest work especially on the air force one um especially with the way that he did the switch especially with the way that he did the, the inside lining and what and all these little details and just um the pigment of them as well looks really good i don't know if it's like i'm assuming it's something that's been worked on many 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 hours um that he kind of slaved over in terms of finding the right hue um the right pantone uh the right contrast whatever it may be to get them to hit this way but they look so good i'm such a fan of them and i really really am now whether or not i'll be able to cop and be able to purchase and have these on my feet also it remains to be seen right but in terms of an Air Force One, this is definitely one of my favorite iterations because what I do like about Virgil when he did make these Air Force Ones similar to the complex ones that he did and the other black ones, um, I forgot the name of those ones, they just, they they follow a simple formula in that he loves the color block or one color. He loves to have the laces be contrasting and then have the silver swoosh, which reminds me, funnily enough, of one of my favorite air max 90s that i used to have back in the day that i actually collected i think i bought them like three times over and ended up reselling them again but they're one of my favorite pairs of f of nike of air max 90s right which is one of my favorite sneakers of all time too actually i say if i if i was to have a top five in no in no order in top five sneakers of all time have to be an air max an air max 90 air force one air jordan four Maybe it's a top three, yeah. MX90, Air Force One, Air Jordan 4. I can't think of it. What was everyone say? Okay, what was it Jordan 1 as my top of all time? Now I can't say that because I didn't wear them enough. Even though I've got loads now. But anyway, we'll get to the story. So I had a pair of uh, MX90s in black um, that I think I'm pretty sure originally I copped them from Foot Locker. But then obviously over time, I ended up buying them on resale from other people on eBay. But essentially what they were, they were like an all black Air Force One with a weird tumbled leather-esque feel to them. And then they had a silver metallic silver swoosh on the side. And if I'm not mistaken, the air bubble was like a slight yellow tint of a color. It wasn't clear. It was like a yellow tint -y sort of a color. They looked so good. And that was one of my, that might have been the reason why I'm so, so obsessed with all black trainers with a little hit with like a white swoosh or with like a white outsole, a white midsole. But I do like that Virgil kind of had the same idea and sort of like flipped it in his own way by having the different sort of colors. But I think that's why I've always been a fan of these Air Force Ones and similar to the complex ones too that I saw that I thought were, cr were absolute crazy because they shouldn't work like this, right? With the contrasting black laces, they really shouldn't work, but they do they really hit for some reason um i love them i know they're, they're they're pretty much goon shoes right for sure all the trappers and all the rappers will absolutely be hoovering these things up but i can't wait to wear wear a pair of these and take some silver markers to the midsole and write something on them you know in kind of as a as a kind of homage to virgil as well and that'll be pretty sick to do because i think they'll they'll really show up pretty well on these but i love them and i think they look bloody awesome like all green ugh, so 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 amazing i'm such a big fan hopefully they're you're able to cop um i doubt it there's no kind of indication of when they're meant to come out are they no we don't really have an indication when they're due to come out but when they do come out agassino will try his best to cop but whether or not he tries and he's successful is two different things Carrying on the theme of Air Force Ones, we have news again, courtesy of Over Under, regarding Kid Cudi acquiring three pairs, not one, not two, but three pairs of the Louis Vuitton and Nike Air Force Ones monograms, which allegedly are limited to 200 pairs. And the majority of them have already been sold in, I think, via Sotheby's or, no, Sotheby's or directly to customers that were offered them. And some sold for over 100 grand, <laughs> right? The highest pair sold for 352 and the lowest for 75, 600. So I'm assuming that was probably a size 9 to 12. And this was probably a size 8 under, I'm assuming, right? But they look so, so good in it. There's all three shoes um, that Kid Cudi bought. 
in that classic monogram colorway too so i think that's awesome um great way to honor your friend great way to honor such an incredible um piece of art as well because let's be let's be for real we're probably never going to see something like this ever again right taking an air force one and an Lou and louis vuitton monogram print and kind of basically putting it on that shoe together knowing the history of an air force one knowing the history of you know um, people from the hood basically cutting up leather bags and and trousers and trench and basically placing that fabric on the swoosh to lux up such a kind of basic trainer and take it to a luxury fashion sort of place we're never going to see this link up again so virgin's legacy has definitely been cemented in that so to have three pairs of these in that classic colorway is absolutely phenomenal and this is a caption courtesy of i guess kid cuddy's instagram it says acquired three pairs at louis vuitton at hashtag virgil Abloh, hashtag virgil forever always repping my brother still rocking the bags the clothes all that all for you v we love you absolutely incredible isn't it imagine being able to cop three of these all at once but that's the thing about them as well even if you were going to be on a resale thing this is a, easily a bargain. You cop these for 100 grand, you're definitely seeing, they, they're never gonna depreciate in value. That's basically what you can guarantee. So if you do want something that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna go up in value similar to like gold, there's nothing better than buying sneakers like this, which is crazy to think nowadays, right? I wonder if there's a, there, there is in it. I wonder what the million dollar sneaker is. What What is that one? That's actually worth a million dollars. I wonder what that is. I'd imagine it's a Jordan or maybe it's one of the first ever Nikes or something. It might be the million dollar shoe. One of those track shoes or something, I'd imagine. Um, but yeah, these look absolutely incredible, man. But big up Kid Cudi for honoring Virgil's legacy. That is pretty sick, mate. So congrats to him. Then quickly, I went to mention this quickly video that I saw, courtesy of um, Over Under again, featuring the eBay authentication team taking a look at the Off-White Air Jordan 5s in sale and basically, you know, doing the whole authentication process live in front of people. And I have to be honest, man, this looks like absolute BS. As I mentioned previously, the levels of quality that people from those replica factories out there in china are able to achieve and get is quite eerie and leads me to believe that i would imagine a lot of those replica factories are just factories that already produce the legit thing and then they go and basically take the cad files or the whatever it is and then go and manufacture it themselves you know outside of ours because it's just impossible that somebody's out there just making them reverse engineer style and then kind of stumbling across a perfect kind of tone color all that this doesn't make any sense so when they do all this nonsense like smelling the soles checking this checking that it doesn't make sense for me because i feel like they're all made in the same factory secondly i feel like the quality of nike shoes in general is super low across jordan brand across nike in general it's just not the greatest so to say that you could spot a fake based on you know imperfections of stitching of the tongue not being here this they're not being that not being there when clearly there's been evidence of loads of people who have bought legit shoes from legit retailers and then they've had them look really fugazi whether or not the the cut or the finish of the swoosh wasn't where it needs to be this finish of the fabric was a bit dodgy there's been so many instances of it so this idea that you can spot fakes by doing all these weird inspections is just it just doesn't hold up for me um especially like i said when there are replica sites out there that pride themselves on selling the closest possible to retail and they even sell them sometimes closer or sometimes more than retail so that you can get them before everyone else does which is weird isn't it because you know imagine buying a pair of shoes that no one has and then trying to flex that they're real it's like come on we all know you probably bought them and they're fake but i just find it very interesting that they've kind of gone into this whole like hoopla and doing this whole pretend thing like they're all real um ebay was one of the best places to cop stuff like this because and obviously ensure that you got real stuff because back in the day when reps weren't that good or when reps were would come out later much later than the actual drop date you could almost guarantee the shoe you're getting was legit if the person that you were buying it from basically purchased them on the day and then sold them the same day on ebay or you saw them the next day that they dropped that would be the only way you could guarantee it so you'd have to buy it within a really short window maybe like a week and then after that it was all it was all hell's got you know no no holes barred basically if you buy something on ebay then after the fact you know guarantee the only other guarantee would be if you bought something directly of somebody through these facebook 
um, groups and stuff where you would meet some where you know there's loads of sneaker heads in your city they have a Facebook group where they basically exchange information talk about shit um, you know hook up deals and then maybe there through you know relationships and whatnot you could you know pinpoint some sellers who are known to only buy real stuff maybe the seller will you know um, show you a receipt and because you know you, you live in the same city you'll probably be more familiar with the store be able to tell if it's real or not but it's still it's still not all you know outside of going to the retail store you're still not sure if you're buying it outside of retail you're really not sure and these days because of the nonsense games nike plays in terms of fudging the numbers and you know creating artificial scarcity there is no way of knowing how many of these shoes are actually made because people then try and make up the difference because there's so much in demand so there is no way of knowing okay cool there's only so many of these left like look at the flipping um trophy room jordans the ones that flipping Marcus Jordan, flipping back door, then he still has a job there, which is incredible to say in the least, isn't it, right? This guy makes his own Jordans, backdoors them and sells them for whatever much money he sold them for outside of a flipping hotel. Yet he's not been, you know, publicly sacked or fired from Nike or anything. That could just show how deep the corruption runs, but that's a story for another day. But yeah, I just thought all these games were a bit pointless personally for me. I'm seeing this video now on the screen of this... um young lady inspecting the the jordans and you know doing these weird inspection tests to make sure that they're authentic and i'm like there's no way to know really is no way to know the reps are so good nowadays people are so thirsty for shoes um resale market is absolutely insane all the it, it just breeds you know for an industry where people are just gonna do some fuck shit because there's too much money to be made um unfortunately that's the position we're in at the moment, but I guess it's, it's worth a try. And I guess it's worth a try. Okay, <clears throat> moving on, we have this news courtesy of Hype Beast regarding one of my favorite brands out at the moment. Maybe one of my favorite brands or the favorite brand of mine, um, headed by the one and only Demna, my boo. Balenciaga have opened pre-orders for its distressed Paris sneaker which is for some reason absolutely captured the imagination of the timeline so much so that everyone's really pissed off and you know giving their two cents on it I don't really understand the outrage um we're living in this what in this kind of what do you call it um indie filth grungy sort of like 20 2000 early 2000 sort of like feel at the moment at this sort of age so if, it, if anything, this whole distressed, you know, severely distressed trainer, artificially distressed sneakers or clothing makes a lot of sense because it makes me immediately think of Little B. Back in the day when Little B blew up and he had those white vans. Remember Little B white vans? Let me see if I can do. Little B white vans. Do you remember? This is the thing. Little B would wear these vans and he wouldn't take them. I think, I don't, I think it was because he wanted to make a certain amount of money. At a certain day but then they just became like a symbol of his but then i guess maybe because he's from is, where's he from is he from like san fran or something right maybe that was a thing too going on around there maybe it was a thing about people um what was this thing what those people called they used to what they used to do that dance that doogie dance whatever it was called there's something going on but this just reminds me of that of that era where people were basically wearing and beating up their vans to crazy levels in the uk what we had were converses we'd have like really beat up converses um especially the white pairs right those are the ones that everyone would kind of get beat up but that's what people were wearing when they went to when they go to like hip-hop shows go to like indie shows whatever it would be like an actual it was an actual thing so when i see these balenciaga distress shoes I immediately think of that and I immediately think of whatever else is on the market now that's being distressed. Just recently, there was a report that was out there that, you know, Jordan Brand were considering making an Air Jordan 1 and basically making it to spec as when it came out in 85. And I was also saying at the time, why don't they just reverse and engineer an actual legit 85 Jordan High, um, I mean Jordan 1 High, and basically make it to spec so that it has all the distress marks and the yellowing of the midsole because clearly people want that sort of stuff. There's guys on Instagram now at the moment who, you know, will take your Jordan and basically distress it for you and send it back to you for a fee. That's, that's become a thing. So when I see people getting their knickers and twists about stuff like this, I wonder if they're actually paying attention to what's actually going on out there. People have been doing this from day. Like this is no different than what Virgil was doing in his trainers, what people were doing with the, the Mars Yards, what was happening when the flipping Triple S's, Balenciaga Triple S, which I had originally dropped. They were purposely scuffed and marked. Even the new um, Balenciaga Defender, was it called Balenciaga? It was a Defender. 
this one even this shoe that's just recently come out this tire defender sneaker this is basically pre-distressed when you buy them brand new they already come with like a weird um you know white chalky sort of overlay finish on them to make them look a little bit dusty like this has been a thing for a while this is not new i understand maybe the price is maybe a bit crazy for what they are like a canvas you know conversey type high top but i don't really see the issue personally for me um i i wouldn't personally wear them for myself because i obviously don't think they would suit, suit my feet but in terms of what they are i don't necessarily mind them i really don't um this article here cuts your uh, sorry hype beast is as follows but yoga continues to grow in its footwear range the demo design pair deviates from previous shoes from the brand which in recent years have single-handedly defined luxury um both the highs and the lows come in either red or black and there's e and there's another white colorway of the highs interestingly it also seems that the colorway plays a part in deciding how much distressing you're likely to get for the white iteration blends yoga opts for a light amount of distressing adding a minor amount of frayed however the black colorway goes all out adding heavy amounts of distressing on the upper all over here the sole unit is always completely also completely messed with blanche yoga branding script on the inside a toe cap is drilled i actually wouldn't mind having this blanche yoga branding you know on some other blanche yoga shoes that i have actually on the instep that actually looks pretty decent not gonna lie um take a look at it and the what's you call it the 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 the, the, the mules retail for four nine five while the white highs come at six five six two five. So how much are the are the are the ones with all the scribbling on it? Because I think those are the ones everyone's getting their knickers and twists for. Those ones might be the grand, because I guess they may be like hand distressed, or something along those kind of lines, right? Um, let's check them out. So yeah, so there's this pair that's even more distressed than the others. I'm not sure if that's a, is that purposely done? Let's see. Why can't you see them when they're super distressed? I wonder what that's about. Or or they're, or they're just showing us a picture of one that they've distressed purposely at that. Because it also reminds me a little bit of the... What's, he, what's it called? Is it Mc, Kevin McFred McFarlane? Was it Nike Vans? Was it a Vandal? Do you remember that? It was like a Vandal. Was it that? Uh, that people would chop up. It had like a foil print where you could chop it up and cut it up a little bit. Um, let's see, Kevin Nike Vandals. That's the one. Is that the one? Yeah, there we go. I found it. This one. Remember this? This came out ages ago, back in the day, where you could basically tear it up and stuff, and cut little pieces out of it, and burn little bits, and then you could get the underneath to show. What were they called? Let's see if I can get the name. That's it. Sorry, it was Jeff McFredrich. That's his name. Not not Kevin. It was Jeff. Jeff McFredrich nike vandals these were really cool and again this is an era where people were going to like indie clubs and whatnot moshing and whatnot and they would wear these sort of things with skinny jeans or what were they called or like um, what the other things people used to be called drop cotch pants like this is a whole situation so yeah you, the shoe itself was like that as you can tell with the upper sort of like a gingami type upper but underneath there was like a silver um base so that you could essentially cut them up and reveal the inside um of them if you so wish some people would burn them some people would do different things yeah look see look how what, what this guy did he burned some bits of it made it come out but it, it ends up making it look like a really interesting sneaker actually yeah, nike vandals very underrated in it very underrated shoe man this was one of the premier shoes back in the day that people used to always wear man vandals are really nice that colorway especially the classic wow someone's saying terminates for five grand crazy okay so i'm not the only one that maybe is thinking vandals might have a might have a, a flipping renaissance let's see how much they're going for on StockX. crazy isn't it let's see let's just type in nike vandal and see how much they're going for 290 people are selling nike vandals for let's see nike vandal high Let's just search for all and see what happens or pops up. Okay, not too bad. But they're all 100 quid though. They're nothing less than 100. They're all going for crazy amounts of money. Let's see how much you can get them for cheap. If people are selling them for less than them. Um, lowest ask or lowest buy? Or is it? Average sale. No, let's do lowest ask. Oh, fucking hell. This thing's hard to use. Okay, lowest ask. Let's see that. Lowest ask on some vandal is 
66 pounds, which isn't too shabby to be fair. But you know, most of these things I'm assuming they probably won't even have in my size. Let's just check them random university, university red one. If they do have these available in a size 10, let's see. Yeah, no, nah. not in my size. So 288 in my size. Shit, Nike Vandals having a right now, sounds isn't it? They're pretty expensive on the resale. Absolutely nutty. But yeah, that was what I went to make. What was I talking about anyway? Yeah, the Blends Yoga Paris sneaker. Yeah, I don't really see the issue with it personally. Um, I think they look pretty sick. I do like what they did with the prime pictures. It's clear that they maybe had, they've got ones that are fucked up, but they're not fucked up maybe to, to the level of the white ones that I saw on the Blends Yoga website. But they're clearly using that image to drum up some bit of attention and get people talking. Do you know what I mean? So you can't hate on that really. Where is it? It's there, yeah. So this image, I haven't even I haven't seen this picture or this level of shoe available for sale. They're just showing you what they're showing you on this site, obviously, as I've seen you as I showed you here, but they're also promoting it using this image. So if anything, Demner's a master at marketing, he's a the master at advertising, master at getting people riled up over nonsense things, because that's what they actually look like. They don't actually look like that when you purchase them. So it's a bit different, but still people are getting crazy about it for whatever reason but they're still a thousand dollars though in it that's pretty steep for what they are but you know luxury brands are always gonna luxury and it's just good anyway in general for see people wearing luxury brands and they're actually beat up instead of actually wearing luxury brands and being afraid to not flip increase the toe box that's what made me wonder like why people do that with, with Louboutins I wonder if there's people out there who exist who buy Louboutin sneakers and actually wear them like sneakers and don't walk like a duck with them like that's why maybe I'd love to actually purchase a pair just to actually wear them as like actual trainers on a day-to-day -day basis instead of like being worried that they might crease so what if they crease do you know what I mean they're sneakers they're ugly sneakers but they're still sneakers fuck it um okay how much was the show I've got already have I spoken about I don't want to run this up too long okay we can still continue um what else we have here yeah let's talk about these I'm a little bit ashamed to say that I like these trainers, but I randomly stumbled across them on Hypebeast and I had no idea they existed. And I have to say, I really, really like them. And I think this might be the, the hood nigger in me kind of coming out, right? The guy that really wants to be on the corner with his plats, you know, flipping, building up a zoo or something and drinking a Rubicon mango. This is what I actually want to do. And I think I actually want to wear these with a pair of skinny jeans and shit and, a, and some chain I got from AliExpress. Because these look so good. So they're, what are they call called? They're, um, take a first look at the Jordan 2 tray Raptors. So essentially they look like, what is it? A Jordan 12, 11. I forgot that model at the bottom. Um, with a Jordan 7, 6 Fusion thing on the top. They look a bit nuts. But I love them. There's something about them that I absolutely like. I don't know what it is. Or maybe it's not. Maybe it's actually just a mashup of loads of Jordans. I'm not really too sure. I haven't read the copy. Because there's, a, there's an 8 there I can see. But they look good, man. Is it just me or am I again? Is it is it the, is it the is it the wannabe roadman in me that that likes these, or am I bugging? Please let me know in the comments down below if you see this video. I beg of you, because there's something about these that I think would just. I reckon I could freak these. I'm for sure. I reckon I could freak these and make these look good, hundred um, percent. What's the text that here? It says since revealing its two its new hybrid Jordan model. The Jordan 2 tray, which is inspired by seven different classic silhouettes. Wow. Okay, that's why you can see them all in there. There's seven different silhouettes in there. Okay. Um, the shoe, which is constructed in mixed um, mesh and uh, features leather mud guards as well as the Air Jordan 11 inspired branding on the label tongues. The silhouette comes in all black base and says, top of the, duh, duh, duh. Take a look at them. So, that colorway is obviously pretty sick, right? Which I'm a big fan of, but there's also a second color, which is this one, which I'm also a very much a big fan of. Um, I know they look like real infantile shoes, and I'm sure they will end up being very popular with college kids. As somebody pointed out here in the hype beast comments, but I can't help but like them, man. I really can't. So they're called Two Tray. I wonder why they're called Two Tray. What a weird name for a pair of sneakers, isn't it? But even the white colorway looks nice with the icy sole. Come on. Those look bad. Why is why do I like these things? I don't know why I like these things. Um, okay, so what Jordan, what Jordans they've got in them? 
they're combining a 6, a 7, an 8, a 13, a 12, and a 14. Okay. So most of the Butters ones, yeah, 6, 7, 8, 11, 12, 13, 14. But they look so good, man. When are they meant to come out? Um, Take a closer look. There's so far no release date on them. But I like them. I have to be honest. I really, really do like them. And, I've, and, I, and I know I might be the minority here. But for me, these look really cool. And I'm sure they might look different in real life. IRL, I'm sure they're going to look way different than what they looked here. But I'm still willing to give them a chance, man. I really am willing to give them a chance. If they can give me a chance, I'll give them a chance. <laughs> I really will. Oh, yeah, yeah. These look so good. Hood Sneakers favorite. Come on. I could freak these. You know I could freak these, man. I could freak these hard. Come on. Look at that. And look how flat they look as well. They actually look like an old school... Um, Jordan in terms of the shape the silhouette they got that nice triangle profile that I love for my sneakers flat no banana toe oh I love them and hopefully I can get a pair when they do drop uh, if you do see them out before I see them out then let me know because I love them I really do um what else do we have here to talk about Oh yeah, let's quickly update here, innit? Do you remember I spoke about that girl who allegedly had taken too many balloons and her appendix burst? Well, she decided to upload an um, an update regarding the whole situation. So I thought, you know, why not? Let's just uh, wrap this up this way by talking about that so you can get an idea of what she's on, um, what time she's on now and how she's feeling because it was a pretty serious topic, but I couldn't help but laugh because it was just, if anything represented how excessive we are as a culture and how much and and why we end up doing the most all the time this was it because you know someone mentioned in my, in my comments actually they said oh most likely she didn't um have her appendix burst because of the nitrous oxide she might have had appendicitis beforehand and the nitrous oxide maybe basically caused a flare-up or something along those kind of lines which i'm not really too sure about because you know me no me no medical expert but regardless let's hear what she has to say in her own words my skin changed colour, I, I, I was very pale, like the brownness in my skin went, I was very pale, um, I was moving all over the place, I was curving my leg, my toes, I was in so much pain, I was screaming, shouting, I was crying, so much fucking tears, I was in so much agony, and also, um, I was out of breath, like my breathing kept stopping, kept stopping, kept stopping, I kept shaking as well, and I was in pain for two and a half hours, from the time she called the ambulance, ambulance took two hours and about two hours and 30 minutes to arrive to the house. And just 10 minutes before the ambulance arrived, I threw up three times, I threw up three times. And when I threw up, I literally jumped up and threw up all over the floor. My mum started to wipe off the floor and stuff like that. Gia was comforting me, Gia was holding my hand. She was reassuring me, trying to keep me calm and stuff. But like I said, the pain was absolutely disgusting. The pain was worse than my ectopic story. This pain felt like I was about to go, like, lights all switched off. My skin changed colour. Jesus Christ. And to be honest, guys, I was like, what? My appendix did what? There was like, Renee, your appendix had burst. Your body is lacking of oxygen. Your body doesn't have enough oxygen to keep going. Your brain is running out of oxygen. Your body hasn't got enough oxygen. The, you so what? Did she turn into a human balloon? Is that why she ended up having an appendix burst? And she's talking way too fast for me, bro. But still... God almighty, man. How much fun does one man need to have or one person need to have? Can you just take a couple of balloons, take them to the face and just keep it moving? And, and and maybe it's just me, but balloons aren't even that fun. It's like smoking shisha. Like after a while, you get bored of it. You get dizzy. You get a bit sick from the smell, from the taste, whatever. Part of the reason why they're fun is because you do them in a sort of social, 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 social setting with your friends, laid back, kicked back, relaxing, having a couple of drinks, sharing a couple of laughs, ha ha, he he. You're not just blitzing them to the face like you're trying to rack up lines or something. It's just, it's a calm thing, isn't it? You would imagine it. But God damn it, man. This sounds brutal. He needs a certain percentage of oxygen to keep moving, keep living. So I was like, wow, I didn't even know these kind of things to myself. Like, I wasn't really educated on it. <laughs> then after, like, talking to... Oh, we know. Don't worry. We know. We know. Doctors and doctors was telling me, they were like, yeah, your body doesn't have enough oxygen. Um, and the substance that you took obviously takes away oxygen from the human body. It doesn't give the human body oxygen. It takes away oxygen from the human body. 
duh that's why you people take it because it's a head high but i wouldn't even i don't even know how i really want to know how she took it though maybe she how did she, how how did she have the nitro did she just do what the kids do nowadays they just take the pump and just stick it in their mouth or did she do it through the um the medium of a balloon i want to know because i don't even know how much how you can take so much because usually when you do a balloon you get really lightheaded when you get lightheaded you can't just immediately go and pick up the balloon again you're not even aware of where you are and your balance is all all fucked up so you're having to kind of recalibrate and get yourself in order and then you can go again but there's only so many you can do because you physically stop i mean it's like i don't know it's like ODing on coke or something I would imagine it's hard because there's only a certain amount you can do before your nose clogs up or before you just go to bed. <laughs> I don't know. So you learn something new every fucking day. Do you understand what I'm saying? After the whole situation now, finding out that my appendix burst inside of me and that I needed to get new, I needed to get my appendix removed. <laughs> I need to get new appendix. Order them straight from Sheen. <laughs> Use my code. <laughs> appendix kill to <laughs> they didn't want to wait the following day as soon as they got the results they was like this needs to come out of you today we don't care if we're operating at 3 a.m. in the morning this needs to leave your body today and to be honest guys now I thought that was it I thought my I thought that my my appendix burst okay they removed my appendix it's out now I don't have to deal with the pain no more so the doctor came back and she's like unfortunately Renee you won't be able to go home you have to stay in hospital for an extra week because you've got a bug in your system, you've got a bug in your blood, which is very dangerous, which we're trying to kill by that, the, um, by having one of these anti -strong, these strong antibiotics that are specifically for that bug, so we can get rid of it. It's in your bloodstream, it's inside your blood, and we have to remove it. She said the reason for the bug is because when your appendix burst, it was come, a lot of pus was coming, and this is the pus that was in my no, young people. I can't look at that, oh my God out there put down the smart whips put down the vapes because i was vaping a lot i was doing smart whips and these things are not good for you it really affects you messes you up inside and like the doctor said that like the doctor said some people are not lucky you can do smart whips for a long time and every time you do a smart whip it doesn't affect you but what you don't understand scientifically is just because you're doing a smart whip of course some everybody's body is different and everybody's body is going to react to it differently but why risk your life why risk your life nah you can't really give that message i'm sorry you can't give that message you just did too much you just did too much i've never in my life heard somebody ODing off of nitrous oxide especially to this level where her fucking lungs burst bruv are you nuts when she had pus coming out of her body that's just doing way too much like how many how many whippets were you doing a day how many vapes were you actually smoking people take those vapes um and again hopefully she gets well in it like um speedy recovery and whatnot but people take vapes on the way to work like you know you would you, you with your colleagues at lunch break and you want to have a quick whatever a quick little toke so you're out on a night out you're drinking you're having some food whatever in it like it's just a vape it's not a big of a deal same with a balloon you're after a night out in the clubs someone's selling them outdoors you might have a couple just to kind of you know give you a little buzz on the way home but that's it you go to bed you don't you don't, you know, tell the guy that's selling the the, the, the flipping balloons, yeah, how much for the whole pump, brother? Do you know what I mean? You just take what he's giving you. Three for five, two for ten, whatever it is, and you just keep it moving. I don't know, man. That's excessive. And then you're getting, oh, don't do it. It's like, nah, man, you just did too much. You can't be giving people advice. I don't think so. But yeah, maybe I'm being insensitive of the issue, but it is what it is, isn't it? It is what it is. Anyway, that has been the Agassi on Zing Show, episode number 575 for now. I'm going to love you and leave you guys. It's been a pleasure to have your company. As per usual, if you enjoyed the show and you like what you saw, what like what you heard, make sure you smash all the relevant buttons down below. If you want to follow me on all the socials and stuff, the links are also down below um, and all that good stuff. You know what to do. And I'll see you guys again very soon. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy what you're going to be doing with your friends and your family and whatnot. And make the best of it. Especially if you're in London. There's meant to be some sort of heat wave this weekend. I'm not sure if that's true. Hopefully it's true. Fingers crossed. You know what it is. Don't watch the weather too much. But if it is sunny out there, go out there. Ground yourself. Get some rays. And enjoy the time that we have available. Because nothing is guaranteed. And until next time, my friends. Take care and peace.